Uh, Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to what is already the 23rd conference of the Disruption Network Lab, Behind the Mask, Whistleblowing During the Pandemic. Uh, my name is Lieke Plucher, and I'm directing the community program at the Disruption Network Lab. And also, of course, a big thanks to Tatiana Batsikelli, who's our artistic director and also the curator of this conference. So uh, in these three days of the conference, we have invited experts that have been speaking out to save other people's lives by denouncing abuses and wrongdoing in the course of the COVID-19 crisis and beyond. And we're currently going to hear more on this in the panel Voices of Care, Exposing Dangers to Public Health. And in this panel, we'll have as speakers Delphine Halgan of the Signals Network, Yvonne Delmark of the Karolinska University Hospital and Swedish Medical Association, and Helen O'Connor, a former NHS nurse and a GMB NHS union organizer. Um, first of all, I'm happy to introduce to you the moderator of the panel, Cassie Thornton. Uh, she is an artist and an activist who makes a safe space for the unknown, for disobedience and for unanticipated collectivity. And in her work, she uses social practices, including institutional critique, insurgent architecture and healing modalities like hypnosis and yoga to find soft spots in the hard services of cap capitalist life. And yeah, her recent book, The Hologram, Feminist Peer-to-Peer -peer Health for a Post-Pandemic Future is also definitely one to check out. So I'm um, handing over to you, Cassie, and thanks for being with us today. Thanks so much, Leica. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and so, so great to be a part of such a, a fascinating and important panel. Um, Leica gave a little bit of a summary of who's here, but today we're going to be talking about this is the panel present the direct experience of experts who will be informing us about abuses and wrongdoings in the healthcare system um, all over the world. And we'll focus on the stories of people who actually work within these systems themselves. In the pandemic, it's crucial to pay attention to the conditions of doctors and patients in hospitals and care facilities the scandals and challenges that they and we face and are facing, how privatization has affected the healthcare system at a global scale, as well as how whistleblowers and healthcare workers have been threatened with disciplinary action for speaking out publicly to expose failings in the system and improve the well-being of patients during the coronavirus outbreak. Um, I know from experience in my own city that right now, this is a really uh, crucial time to demand care for people who are often overlooked in the healthcare system and by the healthcare system. At the same time as it's a really tender time to make sure that the healthcare system is able to continue uh, to do what we need it to do to support people through the rest of the pandemic. Um, so the first person that we're going to hear from today is named Delphine Halgand. And if you've already watched other parts of uh, the conference, you've already heard from her. Um, she's the lead reporteur uh, of the Infodemics Report and the director of the Signals Network. Um, she's gonna tell us what she's gonna be talking about. Welcome, Delphine. Oh, we can't hear you. 
my goodness, that happened to me. Uh, sorry. I was, so thank you so much, Cathy, for the kind introduction. And thank you to the Disruption Network Lab for inviting me today. Um, so I'm Delphine Algan, and as you said, I'm the executive director of the Signals Network, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that supports whistleblowers who have shared public interest information with the press. And uh, today I will talk to you about our work, but especially um, the plasma files investigation. And basically, so we really, I founded the Signals Network three years ago to enable whistleblowers and international media to work together to hold powerful interest accountable. And now we are uh, operational in 11 countries in the US and 10 European countries uh, where we support uh, around 2,000 whistleblowers who have shared information on the biggest media stories of our time. So it goes from corruption to the Me Too movement, to political propaganda online, to health hazard and COVID. And, and they have shared this information with media outlets that goes from the New York Times to The Guardian, to Spiegel, NPR, uh, and so on and so on. So basically, most of the time, the journalist or general counsel of uh, such media send us their sources, their whistleblowers who shared with them information because these whistleblowers, these sources need legal advice, independent legal advice. Uh, they need to talk to experts who can advise them. And, and that's what we do at the Signals Network. But in parallel, we also work with media committed to protect their cases and to work on collaborative investigation based on information shared by whistleblowers. And we already coordinated three major investigations, uh, thanks to partnership with media in the US and Europe. And one was the latest was related, for example, to the Chinese company Huawei. But uh, one was related to blood donations. And that's the one I want to talk to you about. So today, I'm really happy to tell you mo more about this plasma files investigation, as we call it, because I think it's a good illustration uh, of our work. So um, maybe you can go next to the next slide. So what are the, the plasma and even the next one? Sorry. So what are the, the plasma files about? Uh, what did our media partners reveal here? So the plasma files is an international investigation on plasma collection devices manufactured by a US company called Emonetics. So some of these plasma collection machines have been shelved in France since 2018, following a decision of the French authorities. However, the same machine are still in use in the rest of the world. And our media partners raise question about mysterious particles found in collected uh, plasma. So let's watch a short video that was prepared by DITSITE to more easily understand the, the concern here. Uh, can you start the video? It is one of the most important resources for the pharmaceutical industry, and it can only be found in the human body. Blood plasma is needed for many medicines and crucial for treating conditions. Plasma is the liquid part of the blood, making up more than half of your blood. It contains valuable proteins. Some of these proteins can heal wounds. Others are used to treat autoimmune disorders. This is why patients with immune deficiency and blood clotting disorders in particular need medication from plasma. Even a kind of tissue glue can be extracted from plasma, which can increase the chances of survival for victims of serious accidents. Its life-saving properties mean hundreds of thousands of sick people across the world are dependent on plasma donations. But how do you separate the plasma from the blood cells that float in it? During the first stage, plasma donations are similar to blood donations. The blood is taken from the body and runs into a machine. Then a centrifuge spins it. The heavy platelets and blood cells push outwards, leaving the lighter plasma to settle inside, which can then be collected. A plasma donation differs from a blood donation in the final stage, with the blood cells returned to the body, leaving only the plasma kept for donation. Normally, this does not cause any problems, but some machines used for plasma donations can malfunction and particles are released. 
A filter in the machine is meant to stop the larger particles before they can enter the donor's body. But where there are larger particles, there are almost always smaller particles that can bypass the filter and be fed back into the body together with the blood cells and platelets, with unclear consequences for the health of the donors. So that video was uh, released uh, with the articles that uh, DITSITE published. Uh, DITSITE was uh, one of our main uh, partners on, on this story. And so really the, the plasma fires investigation questions whether large number of people, so the plasmers uh, all around the world, have been and still are potentially endangered by apparently a fault-prone machine and a float system of of reporting incident. Um, I think it's it's also a story of um, flow in the reporting system. So it's important to keep in mind that Emonetics, the, the company here, is one of the three global leaders in the blood processing industry and exports to over 50 countries. And we're talking about a company who had revenues worldwide of more than $900 million. <laughs> it's also important to keep in mind that plasma the EU considered the need to reduce its dependency on imports from the US. So really the plasma is considered kind of the gold um, of the pharmaceutical industry and, and so on. So going back to the story a little bit here. So concerns initially raised by whistleblowers and union representatives in France, and then um, uh, a French authority decision led to this machine to be taken out of the French market. We're talking about 300 machines. 50% uh, of all the plasma collection machines used in France were, are, are out of the market since 2018. And really a, a criminal complaint was filed in France against the company by uh, former employees and plasma donors. But we're still waiting uh, from an answer or uh, to the investigation launched by the judicial system. So the, the judicial procedure is still ongoing in France. And our media partners on this investigation found that the particles um, the former employees reported in their lawsuits have been an occurrence since 2005. And it is, an, it is not just happening in France but around the world. So basically the internal company documents received by our media partners attest to this. The issue involving the particles can be found in a collection of reports uh, on more than 36,000 irregularities involving a monetics machine in 40 countries. Can you show the map please uh, to show the 40 countries where um, we know from the internal company documents that irregularities happened. And except in France, the machines are still in use today. So what role did the signals played in, in this investigation? So basically whistleblowers, plural, shared hundreds of internal documents with our media partners. And then at the signals network, we coordinated the logistic of this collaborative investigation so what does it mean? It means that we organized weekly calls between the journalists to assess and push progress on the investigation. Uh, we organized the online safety protocols for the journalists to work safely. And we did that for months and months. It takes a lot of time to investigate hundreds of documents, to investigate uh, what happened in different countries. And uh, at the end, we all publish, um, uh, enfin, all our media partners publish on the same date. But in parallel to the coordination of the media investigation at the Signals Network, we also provided legal support to some of the whistleblowers uh, who needed it. And we did that in different countries uh, in over the world. And so uh, you can maybe show the slide with the media partners. Um, on this investigation, we worked with uh, media um, from Germany, the Zeit, Spain, El Mundo, Italy, Il Fatto Quotidiano, France, uh, Mediapart, but also the French Public Radio, Radio France, Netherlands, NRC. In the US, we worked with the McClatchy uh, Miami Herald. And really, these media partners, they represent uh, actually a cumulative audience of one, 165 million readers in six languages. 
And we were very proud because the Plasma Files article were the most read articles for DITSAIT and Mundo and NRC for the whole week of publication in, in July 2020. So the, the media worked together in order to maximize the impact of the uh, documents shared by the whistleblowers. And they shared the received information, investigated the lead together, and they decided on the format and angle and, and published under a common embargo. So and now it's the turn to the national authorities to investigate what we have revealed, because uh, it's the question of uh, will more authorities agree with the decision of the French um, that was made in France to maybe taken out of uh, the market this machine and it's it's an ongoing work so for example at the signal network we do not stop at the publication of the investigation we do not stop at uh, providing support to the whistleblowers we also actually filed the equivalent of a FOIA request to know what happened to the 300 plasma donation machine taken out of France uh, we are still waiting for an answer from the French authorities on what happened to these 300 machines. Uh, are there are there somewhere where they're redistributed in other countries in the world? We don't know. And so definitely at the Signals Network, we remain committed to maximize the impact of this investigation, both in terms of uh, keeping the public informed, but in terms of seeking justice for any wrongdoing, potential wrongdoings. And the media remain committed to report on the follow-up. So it's it's a long, long term, long time, long process, but uh, it's it's worth this uh, collaboration and effort because we do believe that's that's how we will um, obtain real change and impact. And um, I just want to finish to thank uh, again all the whistleblowers, uh, the journalists and the lawyers who made this investigation possible, but we still have a lot of work ahead of us to, to, to go to, uh, to the end of this story. So uh, I look forward to the discussion to discuss more uh, this plasma file and to hear from your, your thoughts. Thank you so much, Delphina. Um, I'm really interested in the conversation that we're going to have afterwards because I have a million questions for you. Um, and next, I'm going to introduce Yvonne Delmark. Um, she is a rheumatologist, the vice chairman of the Swedish Medical Association, and a workers' representative as the chair of the Medical Association at Karolinska University Hospital. Karolinska, one of Sweden's top hospitals, is now described as the most expensive hospital ever built after a controversial rebuild. Delmark has criticized the hospital for their staff cuts pre-COVID, for the lack of plans for COVID-infected personnel during the pandemic, and has asked Stockholm Region to publish numbers of how many hospital staffers have required hospital care for COVID-19. Yvonne, welcome. Thank you, and thank you so much for your kind presentation. I'll try to tell you a little bit of our current situation at the hospital. Uh, the COVID-19 situation um, is really a new thing. Uh, when it came a year ago, nobody could expect what was happening. And the hospital with its staff have managed to rebuild uh, inside and take care of uh, a lot of COVID patients. Uh, we have done things that we didn't think were possible a year ago. Initially, there were a shortage of many things, protective gear, uh, respirators, beds, uh, knowledge uh, amongst staff and actually medicine as well. Um, but we've learned a lot uh, through this year and uh, a lot of information uh, for the patients is gathered and today we have um, improved treatments that they have changed during the year uh, according to new knowledge. So today the patients have a much better prognosis than they had a year ago, but there is still need for extra ICU beds 
we have had two waves of uh, patients and the third is already here. So we have a lot of things to do. Uh, all staff is tired. Uh, everyone have uh, worked a lot over the top limit during the year. And um, now the third wave is coming uh, as well as the summertime. Um, we were expecting to have relief during the vac vaccine period, but now there are obstacles with the vaccines that you might know about, uh, so we can't really, really rely on them. Uh, we have managed to do a lot, uh, but it has a cost. Uh, the upscaled COVID care is not an ordinary ICU care, uh, nor an ordinary healthcare situation at, at the other wards that have been taking care of the COVID patients. When we um, imp uh, improve and manage to take care of so many patients at the same time with staff that are not used to these patients, they are not uh, exactly the same quality but everyone ha have done their very best to take care of the patients and do as good as possible. Uh, during the year, it has been uh, discussions um, how we are have prior prioritized by the patients. Um, a little bit unnecessary because most of those discussions were early in the phase when we expected a lot of patients that we couldn't take care of at all. But somehow, uh, at least Stockholm County Council have <laughs> managed to arrange uh, health care uh, to everyone. Uh, but uh, uh, if you have followed the Swedish media, you might have seen that it has been a lot of discussion uh, how we have taken care of the elderly people that were not uh, allowed or were not taken care of at the hospitals. But through this year, uh, this um, uh, healthcare has also improved. So today I think we can be quite proud of the care is, which is given to all of the patients. Um, but it is, it's not possible to work like this in the long run because everyone is working uh, much more than they ought to do according to, to our uh, rules about working time and so on. Um, I lift this up because the politicians think somehow that this level of care, the amount of care that we are giving now, that we can continue like this afterwards. But we can't unless we accept a lower quality of care. Uh, <laughs> then I'll try to talk a little bit because uh, there have been a lot of experts uh, coming through. Uh, we have a lot of experts at Karolinska Institute and Karolinska Hospital and other hospitals as well. Uh, and uh, all have worked together to gather information about this new disease. And very many things they agree upon, but not everything. And if you read media, they often focus on the things that they don't agree on. And as a... a, a member of the society, you can get the impression that we don't know nothing. But the experts do a lot, know a lot of things. Uh, but of course, uh, the knowledge changed uh, when more knowledge is uh, accessed and gathered. Um, it's also a fact that a lot of people call themselves experts, although they are might not be one, especially when uh, established, established experts talk about areas where they in fact are not experts. And thus, this is also um, making some uh, forbidding. <laughs> Sorry, you have to help me out here. <laughs> um, but, um, it's important when you uh, are reading about an expert to see where they have their expert area uh, and to uh, consider it to evaluate the, the source of knowledge before you act upon it. Uh, 
And for the experts to come through, it takes a lot because uh, the climate in social media where almost everything is exposed is quite hard. And if you try to tell something that um, is not in the line with the knowledge uh, with everyone else, it's, uh, it can be, uh, you can be very exposed. And uh, even experts have fallen into uh, to threat the person that leads the message message instead of um, arguing with facts. And that is quite sad because uh, then the climate is hardening on social media and news. And then uh, we have an example at Jonas Ludvigsson that is a researcher at uh, Karolinska Institute that got uh, a lot of hatred um, by publishing a, an article of uh, uh, sickness uh, with kids. Uh, he showed that the kids weren't so, um, they weren't so sick. Uh, they, they get COVID-19, but only a few of them were really so sick that they needed hospital care. Uh, and this was not in um, line with others' opinion. Uh, and he, it went so far that he expressed that he wouldn't do research in this area anymore. And this is a dangerous situation if, if more of our good researchers uh, make such a statement. But there are also good groups in uh, social media uh, that really collaborate and uh, get facts together uh, and spread facts through the countries. And this has been uh, very much helpful to improve the situation for the patients. Uh, another obstacle is that if we want to tell something about healthcare, it's uh, rarely uh, simple questions. Um, and to get something out in the news and media, you have to simplify it quite a lot uh, or make it simple. And that is not always doable with uh, medical facts and uh, the situation in healthcare. Uh, and especially hard to get through is if uh, your story is uh, somehow threatening the, the established truth. Then we have another problem, <laughs> uh, and that is the algorithm at the internet. Uh, if you uh, believe in something like the virus COVID-19 is not existing, and search for that in the internet, you get more and more uh, of the same thing. And it's very hard afterwards to find facts that COVID-19 really exists. Um, so that is also making it more troublesome to, to reach everyone uh, with uh, real facts. And do we have a culture of silence at the hospital? Yes, we have, because we have a strong line of decision makers. Uh, and uh, they, the first line uh, managers do have to, a competition to get resources and then it's not popular to tell that something is not working. And the culture we have, um, they are easier if you find someone who have made a mistake rather than to tell that the system is not working. And uh, at least Karolinska Sjukhuset and uh, Karolinska University Hospital and the Karolinska Institute both have strong trademarks and they do very much good things. But we still have to be able to talk about what is not functioning perfect to make it perfect. And to be a whistleblower is very hard. We have examples for that too. Um, Macchiarini case, uh, but we have others less known. Uh, don't be alone. Uh, to have an organization that supports you sounds uh, great. But if you think about um, telling some, something like a whistleblower, uh, take support um, at your trade union, at colleagues, uh, but don't go alone from the beginning. It's very hard. Uh, we have uh, systems to, to lift up uh, irregularities. We have a whistleblower system, we have 
uh, a system for patient safety, but um, I can go into that too, but it's not easy as a colleague to go that way. It's the caregiver who are supposed to report irregularities, not the colleague. Uh, but then we have media la frihet, uh, which means that we can go to media and tell uh, about anything really, uh, without breaking uh, the silence uh, among through patients. And uh, the, uh, that's the best way to, to expose things, but there are still obstacles because if it's a very specific case, you can always say, tell how, uh, who was telling from the beginning. And the conclusion is that we have to accept criticism because if criticism is not accepted, uh, improvement is impossible. And the role of critic must be worked into the system. Both positive and negative criticism are crucial to improve. And uh, no, I think I'll stop there. Uh, I have to thank you all uh, for giving me the possibility to be part of this panel. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion afterwards. Wow, Yvonne, thank you so much. We have so much to talk about. Um, it's so much work to call, to make critic that, to be critical. Um, especially right now. So thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you're talking about. Um, I now have the honor to introduce Helen O'Connor. Um, Helen has worked as a nurse in the UK uh, at the NHS, the National Health Service, for 28 years. As cutbacks and privatization were rolling out, she saw the adverse impact of this on workers and on patients. She became active in the union as a result and led some opposition to plans to cut pay and services. In 2018, she became a full-time organizer for the GMB union and now, organizer, now organizes workers in hospitals in South London. Welcome, Helen. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and the contributions have been absolutely fascinating so far. So I feel really privileged to speak at this event. I just wanted to take you through some slides that I've prepared just to give you an overview of um, the NHS before the pandemic and then during and um, specifically focus in then on how the workforce themselves are being treated. Um, so the first slide, um, so we have a national health service in the UK. What that means is it's free at the point of need. So you don't have to insurance, it's not mandatory to have insurance to access healthcare. And it's safe, there's two points of access, either the family doctor or the casualty department. And it's accessible when it's needed by the public, it's paid for by taxation. And in the UK, we believe that everyone has the right to free healthcare and healthcare is a right, it's not a privilege. So that's the basis on which our National Health Care Service was found. And what we're finding now, it's being gradually stripped away from us and this has been happening for decades actually so it's been happening since the 1980s and what we've seen is um, defunding of health services which means that hospital wards for example are closing community services are closing and what we've seen is private big private companies come in um, and basically take over the management of the non-care services and some of the care services as well so the private companies tend to take over in the hospitals the cleaning the portering and the catering services so they tend to be outsourced in most of the hospitals now it's in fact it's rare in london to go to a hospital where they're not taken over by the by the private companies. Um, the other thing we've seen in the NHS is a lot of um, reconfiguration of services and it's sold to the staff like it's a, it's a good thing, but actually what it generally means is services are moved, they're merged, they're concentrated, and it just means a reduction and it means things get very confusing because the patient is used to a ward being in a certain place, it's not there anymore, or a service being in a certain place, it's got a, a new name. So it's very confusing, it makes it confusing for patients to navigate the services properly. 
And what we've seen over time as well in all aspects of UK healthcare is um, workloads increasing for staff. Um, the skilled, experienced staff, when they're leaving, um, they're not being replaced. They're being replaced by more junior staff. So we're seeing um, the numbers falling, but also the skills levels are falling as well. And that's happening throughout the NHS as well, even before the pandemic. Um, and the other thing, there is a culture of silence, like the previous speaker said, it's no different in the UK. So we've had this culture of silence where people um, feel very afraid that there'll be consequences if they do speak out about um, failures in patient care, our unsafe situations on wards, etc. And what we've seen as well develop with privatisation is um, an influx of managers going into very, very senior senior positions in the National Health Service. And um, these managers don't have any clinical experience, so they don't really know what the frontline jobs are involved, basically, and that can lead to wrong decisions being made at the top too. Next slide, please. So the NHS has been broken over decades. Um, so be, even before the pandemic, we ended up with 100,000 vacancies and 40,000 nurse vacancies. And there's been a massive reduction in hospital bed capacity capacity from 299,000 in 1987 to 141,000 between 218 and 219. So in the UK, we now have fewer beds per head of the population than in other comparable health systems in other comparable countries. Um, the privatisation of the cleaning and the hostess, the meal services, has led to um, a reduced standard of cleaning simply because staffing complements get cut back um, and the meals, we've had the change from fresh food to instant food come into the hospitals as well, which is um, which is not good for patient recovery. Um, and overall, across the NHS, we see lax, very lax health and safety. And um, there's been a trend in the UK to cut cut back on health and safety. The health and safety executive has been defunded over many, many years, which means it's very, very difficult um, for health and safety to be enforced and employers who don't um, have good health and safety, they can't be prosecuted basically because the resources aren't there anymore. So that's a really big consequences for the NHS and for patient care. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So I want to just to move to the onset of the pandemic now. So in the UK, we were hearing from February 2020 that um, the pandemic had reached Italy and Spain, and we were seeing all of the horrific news stories that were coming out of those countries and the fact that people were dying. So we had some sense over here that the pandemic was spreading. Um, and what I noticed in that period when I was going around the hospitals doing my job as a trade union organiser is that there was very little um, pre-planning or there was very little sense that there was was something big coming to the shores of the UK. So I didn't see any precautions or planning being taken about infection control measures. Um, I didn't see any zoning. Um, so that what that meant in the early stages is that the people with the COVID-19 who were coming into the hospitals were mixing in with all the other patients, which would, of course, accelerate the spread of COVID-19. Um, personal protective equipment for staff has been a massive issue in the UK, and there's two reasons for that. Um, what we had is a lack of personal protective equipment in the first place, but also then we'd a real, there's a real difficulty getting it into the hospitals as well. And some of the managers in the private companies who are managing the cleaners and the porters and the caterers were saying to the staff, the pandemic is fake news, it's not real, don't worry about it, just carry on. So there was a real business as attitude, uh, usual attitude going on throughout the NHS at that stage. But our members, however, were worried and they were contacting GMB and they were expressing their concerns about a pandemic coming and how they were going to be safe and protected while they were doing their jobs to keep the country running. Um, we had a situation as well where a crisis developed within a crisis. Um, there's a transnational company called I. I don't know if you know it over, over here, but um, they they basically failed to pay the cleaners and the porters and the caterers in Lewisham Hospital. They failed to pay them for the hours worked. And they did this three times in a row. And what that led to at the beginning of March was all of those staff 
walking out of the hospital. So we had this situation where coronavirus patients, Lewisham Hospital was one of the first hospitals actually in London to get a coronavirus patient. And now we had a situation where the cleaners were walking off the job because the company was treating them so badly. So it's an absolute disaster. Next slide, please. So basically, um, there was failings in leadership at all levels in, in, in the UK around dealing with the pandemic. So like I said already, um, the PPE was very late to get to the hospitals, the personal protective equipment. So it was late and it was low quality. So our people in the hospitals were just wearing um, flimsy surgical masks when they could get them, flimsy apron and gloves. And one of the ambulance crews said, I'm, I've got sandwich marrying quick wearing kit and I'm dealing with a pandemic, I'm afraid. In other countries, we saw people in gowns and eye protection and visors and everything when they were dealing with the pandemic. So we knew, we knew that um, our, our people were at risk in the trade union. So we started pushing very, very hard in that, trying to get the um, let the, the guidelines changed, etc. We did a lot of work around that. Um, there was very little testing for the virus. And um, we certainly know in the UK that there's workers who were on the ambulance services um, who had COVID coronavirus type symptoms, but they couldn't access the test, particularly if they were with the private companies. Um, also, very poor infection control advice was being given to the hospital staff. For example, we had um, people being told to take off their masks and the gloves and the aprons in the hospital corridors in case they'd frighten the patients. Um, and like I said already, late cohorting and zoning of patients was a feature as well. So going specifically to personal equipment, protective equipment, there was a real shortage and there was a lack of ability to get PPE in because the logistic system had been completely fragmented due to, due to privatization. So the government had to very, very quickly set up another logistic system to try and ensure that the PPE was getting into the hospitals. And like I said already, the workers had the lowest grade PPE and um, there was very, and the outsourced staff particularly were really, really struggling to get hold of the PPE. So what we saw was um, the clinical staff were getting it we're getting it and then there'd be none left or it'd run out by the time the cleaner or the porter or the caterer would get to the ward. We ended up in a situation where hospital staff were wearing bin bags as aprons and there was lots of cases of out of date or corrupted PP that wasn't fit for purpose as well. Next slide please, thank you. Um, so what we have in this country um, with the private companies is that they don't pay wages when staff go sick. So what sick staff end up with is statutory sick pay, which is very low. It's the equivalent of £95 a week. And there's no way a sick worker can pay their rent and their food and everything with this little tiny money. So um, we started campaigning in this as a trade union in 2018, because what we found was when workers don't get wages when they go sick, they come into work when they're sick, They've got an infection and then they spread the infection to the vulnerable patients. So that's very serious. That's why we started campaigning about it. And we took this into the heart of government in 2018. I met with um, Health Minister Matt Cancock myself and raised this issue in 2018, way before the pandemic, because we were worried about it then. Um, and throughout the pandemic with the private companies, we've had a contract by contract battle to even get them to pay full wages when staff go off sick with COVID. And there's many who are still not paying full wages even now. Um, what happened with our campaigning on sick pay is that the government did change the statutory sick pay legislation. And they said instead of a three day wait, they paid from day one, but it's still not enough. That's the point. And people still can't pay their bills if they get sick and they work for a private company. So like I said, with sick workers coming in and out of hospitals and a huge cross infection, risk. So I'll skip very quickly on to the hospital staffing. So we had huge numbers of staff off sick for long periods because they were all catching COVID. And this was to this was as well as there was a backdrop of a recruitment crisis anyway. So the recruitment crisis was exacerbated. Staff were far busier because the patients were more unwell, harder work, and staff were forced into unsafe working conditions without the PPE. So they were picking up coronavirus. And staff were threatened with disciplinary action if they spoke out to the press. So again, we challenged that as a trade union. And there was a lot of staff annual leave and holiday cancelled because the, 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 the staffing crisis was so, was so bad that staff had to cover, had to not take their leave. It made them even more exhausted. Um, so it was a really, really bad situation and it's ongoing. Um, so the impact of COVID-19 on the staff, 
Um, like I said, many became sick with the virus themselves. Some developed this condition long COVID. They still have it now. We had um, almost 1,000 health workers in this country die from coronavirus, including our members in the GMB trade union. Um, people that I know, myself, who died. Um, people are exhausted from overwork, absolutely exhausted, desperate for a break. And there's a lot of mental trauma as well because um, people are dealing with more death, more distress. Um, so people have this condition, post-traumatic stress, stress disorder. It's developing, it's rising. So we're concerned about a massive mental health crisis. Um, the mood of the staff at the moment is feeling demoralized, feeling exhausted, feeling undervalued. The government of the country hasn't helped because they ignored them in the last public sector pay announcement. So we had a situation where um, the staff feel, they've gone from feeling demoralized to feeling quite angry now. And that's, yeah, that's a previous slide about a cleaner and her workload that's quite interesting there to look at. Um, so we had the staff um, basically say, right, we've had enough. And that's where the demand for a 15% pay rise came from. NHS staff feeling fought tired, demoralized, feeling ignored by the government. So they said, right, we want a restorative pay rise for all of the wages that have dropped down over the last 10 years. So that's how the NHS Pay 15 campaign sprang up. Um, and in GMB, um, which is the very last slide, I can talk about the role of my trade union very quickly. What we've been fighting for throughout the pandemic with our members is safe workplaces. So we've been trying to support the representatives. We've led some collective actions around very poor health and safety. Examples of that is we've done petitions, we've done collective grievances, and we've even had some protests as well, including one outside Epsom and St. Helier last week, where once again, a private company was not paying staff for the hours that they're working. So it's very serious. We also work with the media and with the MPs to expose the wrongdoing. And right now, the NHS Pay 15 is a very, very important campaign in this country because what we want is we want to deal with the recruitment crisis and we want to retain staff in the NHS because it's so important for the future of healthcare in this country. And the staff understand the link between their own pain, their conditions being right and excellent patient care. And when I'm speaking to staff as a trade union official, I always say that if you're exhausted, you're demoralized, you're undervalued, you cannot give good care to patients. So that's why this NHS Pay 15 is so important to us in the UK as a campaign and for our members as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. Wow, thank you so much. Um, I think my internet cut for a second. Is it? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. It sounds like it seems like okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Helen. I mean, right off the bat, I think it just it feels so overwhelming um, and so so sad the the loss of life, and especially for people that are working that have been working already for a year in this crisis in hospitals. It's I, I think it might just be a time to just take a second people because it's there's nothing there's nothing I can possibly say except like thank you and to take a second. Um, I have so many questions for each of you and I'm sure that you also have questions for each other. Um, the thing that occurs to me might familiar or unfamiliar, but um, I'm, I'm hearing a lot about um, silencing. And um, I, I heard, I think each of you mentioned silencing um, and specifically like a culture of silence. Um, to be a whistleblower it is a lot of work. It's a really specific type of work. Um, and it made me think about the work of the theorist Sarah Ahmed, um, who talks a lot about what it means to be, to make, um, she's written a lot about being a feminist killjoy or somebody who, um, who makes a complaint against someone who has more institutional power. Um, especially she's coming from the position of being a racialized woman, um, feminist in institutional workplaces like academia. But what she says is that when you make a complaint, you become the complaint. 
in the eyes of the powerful. And it's, it's a special kind of work. And I think it's, it's really incredible to see the type of work that is happening right now where people who are already working so hard in healthcare um, to, keep, to keep saving lives, to keep the institutions going, are also now put in a position and be the ones to critique the system that they're a part of. Um, I guess I just wanted to talk, I wanted to hear about uh, like where that sits with you and what type of work it is to be a whistleblower um, and how being a whistleblower is, it's such a sensitive position where you're, you're asking for change but at the same time, sometimes you become sort of like the enemy of the people that have the, po the, the potential to make change. I just wonder if anybody wants to reflect on the work of the whistleblower in that way at this time. Do you want me to come in on this one now? Oh, sure. Yes. Please. Yeah, so I always say um, when I'm organizing in the NHS, and um, particularly in the NHS, if you want to raise a complaint, it's very, very important to not do it on your own. That's the first point. So building solidarity with your colleagues is so important. And if you're going to raise a complaint about patient safety or anything of that nature, do it together and do it with the backing of your trade union behind you. So that's why for me, trade union organizing in healthcare is so important. Um, and so little of it happens actually. And sometimes people do feel that they have to go on their own. And I think that's personally, for me, I think that's the worst thing you can do. I think that's when, when you will get attacked. And I can tell you about my own experience when I was a nurse myself in the NHS and there was a pay cut planned for us, group of, group of people. So um, nobody would stand up. So I had no choice at that point but to become a union representative myself, which I did do. And we together organized collective action. And I remember people ringing me up saying, oh, you're going to be a troublemaker forever. You're going to get sacked. None of those things happened. None of those things happened. And actually what happened is the organization couldn't do the pay cut in the end. because so many people were opposed to it. So that's the power of organizing and everybody doing, the, doing it together. You're safer and stronger in numbers. I, I totally agree with uh, with this and actually in the example I gave of the plasma files, it was really um, a French union who took on uh, the information raised by whistleblowers plural and the power of the unions made that they had the access to uh, the uh, health authorities in the countries and they were able to push the authorities to do their job basically. And so the, the unions really help in many ways um, when it's possible, and I think in healthcare it's possible, they help because it doesn't become a one individual troublemaker issue, it becomes a collective issue. And so basically, when you have a group of whistleblowers with the union, it's not one guy with an issue and the, it's, it, it's less about the complainer, it's more about the issue, and that's what we want. And the union uh, usually has the links with the authorities, knows how to talk to these people, knows to manage the press. And so really when it's possible, uh, and that's why uh, powerful unions are very important um, in, the whistle, in the safe and efficient whistleblowing system, it's really great to be able to, to work with the unions um, to obtain a change. So I, I really agree with that. Of course, in some sectors like bank and corruption, there's no real unions. But I think uh, in the healthcare system, there's a, that's one uh, other really important role that unions can play. There we go. Um, Yvonne, I was really thinking about you when I asked that question, um, because you you were the one that actually said that there was really a culture of silence in the hospital. So I wonder in how it has been for you as a person who has spoken up, um, how that's felt, how it's gone, what else is, is next? 
I have to say that it's not a, a culture of silence in every space in the hospital. There are areas with uh, good managers that uh, allow uh, the colleagues to speak up and they can go together, but some other areas with managers that are more insecure, it can be very hard to uh, say anything against uh, the leadership. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we can uh, help uh, the colleagues who works there to stand up for their rights and to take things um, and work with them to make a better work environment. Uh, it's mostly on that uh, kind of errands that are uh, for the moment. Uh, when it uh, have been uh, patient uh, care problems, um, there are a culture of silence there too, but not always. It depends on what it's about. Uh, and we work with that um, kind of things too. We, we showed uh, already five years ago that uh, our system to, to tell about uh, patient care risks is not used because it doesn't lead to any change. And since then we have uh, intermittently tried to raise the question of how we work with patient safety when we see problems. Um, and in some areas, they really work in a good way uh, together, and other areas are more problematic. Uh, and when we are talking about that, it sounds so uh, ill that, that there are a culture of silence in some places, but there are also a very strong will in other areas to be really good in care. So you can't take uh, it, you can't take the whole hospital in one. I don't know if that was uh, a good answer for your question. Oh, for sure. I mean, I think it's such a fine dance um, to, to call something out while maintaining the strengths. Um, because I think when you're when you're criticizing an institution, um, especially a vital institution like a hospital, we need the hospital to continue to do its work. So how do we do that in a way which is like incisive and assertive without, and, and not condemning the whole thing, but allowing certain things to continue and other things to be challenged. Um, I was really curious also specifically something that Delphina said, um, and I think it might, I don't know, it might open up to talk about something a little bit bigger, but I was, you said that um, in Signals, you work to figure out what it means for journalists um, in the plasma files to investigate safely. And I was wondering what that means, because you're not facing the same types of dangers, I think, as um, somebody in a healthcare workplace. But then when you are interfacing with healthcare, I don't know what it means for journalists to be safe in that situation. Okay, so that's very interesting you picked on that, which actually shows that my unconscious speak, <laughs> because in my previous work, I was uh, working for an organization called Reporters Without Borders, where I was working really on the immediate physical safety of journalists. And for years, I worked on cases of uh, American journalists hostage in Syria. and Afghanistan and so I guess this past comes with me and I always think of the safety of everybody I work with so it's funny that um, uh, it, it comes up like that but what I meant when I, I said that at the Signals Network we work uh, with media to ensure that they can work safely with their sources what uh, what we mean by that is that we make actually kind of moral pledges with the media we work with, that they are coming to put the uh, safety and protection of their sources at the core um, of anything they do, that they are committed to share and collaborate with other media to uh, prioritize the impact of the story. And how, so that's uh, the aspect of this moral pledge with the media that we, we work with. And then it translates into 
getting this media to work with our online tech experts to put in place uh, secure ways for sources to reach out to the journalist. So we actually organize, organize online security trainings with the media partners that we work with, with the journalists we work with, and it's ongoing because the technologies, the process are, are ongoing. So it means working with PGP emails, but trying to find easier way, like uh, using Signal more and more. What are also, uh, so how, how could sources reach out safely to journalists? How then could journalists work safely between themselves with sometimes very sensitive documents that uh, could help identify the sources? Um, so, and how can we make sure that uh, no information is released in the article published that could lead to the identification of sources that wish to remain anonymous? So, the safety of the sources are always in our mind in whatever we do. And uh, because I explain maybe my past, I guess I, I have with me this obsession of safety for the people I work for and with. So, But also, most of the time when I talk to whistleblowers, I start by saying it cannot be 100% safe. <laughs> by blowing the whistle on powerful actors, it, we can do a lot to maintain to make sure you will remain anonymous and so far we it worked but it, it, blowing the whistle uh, on powerful actors is is uh, is not a zero risk um, adventure totally um and it seems like it's so much about building trust um between the people that are working together to to call something out or um and I think, I, I guess I was wondering if anybody had any interesting stories. I bet Helen might have um, a story or two about what happens when a, someone comes forward with a story um, that needs to be fought for by union action. Like, um, how do you protect those people and distribute the responsibility? And like, what happens between the people in the union and that person? Um, as you begin to form someone's rights. Yes, um, so in terms of stories, um, our representatives and our members had to deal with a large private company working in St. George's Hospital who wanted to cut the hours. So they wanted to take away hours from the cleaning, the porters and the catering staff. And they launched this, I think it was 2019. So they told us they were going to do it. Um, we knew from speaking to our members that they did not want that because as it stood, they couldn't get enough hours because the pay is so low, they couldn't actually get enough hours to live on. So we knew there was no way they'd accept a cut in hours. And plus we were thinking about the impact on the hospital, with the cleaning being cut because the hospital wasn't any smaller. So we were thinking about the cross infection risk to the patients of so areas of the hospital potentially not being cleaned, uh, moving over to spot cleaning as opposed to thorough cleaning and just the impact of that for the patients and the public coming in. So what we did in that situation was obviously we started a campaign straight away. Um, yes, it was very difficult um, dealing with the management of the private company. Um, they did try to bully the representatives um, I remember on one occasion, um, they even, um, we walked into the canteen for a meeting and they tried to pull, put him at the meeting, um, but the members just pulled us into the meeting and made us sit down. So they completely defied management. I think they were so angry at what was going on and what the consequences were for them, for their pay, for the hospital, that they just wanted the union there and made it very clear. So they stood up. They all stood up to management. Uh, we balloted them for industrial action um, off the back of the campaign. We got a huge turnout, a massive turnout. So we absolutely broke, smashed all the thresholds that were put in the anti-trade union laws in 2013. So the members, huge turnout for the ballot. And once we had that official ballot result in our hands, we didn't even need to take a single day of strike action. The company started backing away because they knew they knew they the power the power balance had shifted. So suddenly it was the members had a lot more power in the union and then they negotiated and then we could work together and resolve it. So even the threat of um, 
threat of um, that action. So we did everything. We set up strike committees. I mean, it was a big, long, really hard campaign. I don't think I don't think any of us who were involved in that had a night's sleep or kind of a short day in you know a month or so. It was really, really difficult. But what we had to do is we had to build confidence. And we had to say, look, this is wrong. How, we had to outline how, how it was going to affect people, how it was going to affect patients. The community supported us as well. We got invited to the trades councils to speak about the issue with huge solidarity from the, from the public. So it was, yeah, it was incredible. Um, I'm noticing a habit or a pattern here. Um, Anyway, thank you so much for that story. And um, what I was hoping we could do here for the last five minutes is, I think um, both Yvonne and Helen talked a little bit about working with the media. And um, Delfina here like has such a kind of a, a, a big, wide reaching strategy for what's possible with the media. I'm wondering if either Yvonne or Helen wanted to talk about um, like, what you wish was possible um in terms of your media strategy like what what if you could really work with the media in any way like what that might look like what you would like to, to try to make that do and maybe delphina could respond after um with some ideas about strategy um based on her experience yeah. I can start with one uh, real wish, uh, and that is the logarithm, uh, logarithm of the internet to take them away, to get people to see what's really there, not what they've already seen. I think this is the most important if we want to have uh, discussions in the future, because otherwise we will get divided uh, before we even, even have the chance to talk to each other. and. If that goes on uh, through AI and other things, uh, we don't have a chance to reach out to the people that, um, that need the information. Uh, so that's uh, the thing. <laughs> uh, then we work with media, but we have to take uh, in uh, their circumstances in uh, so if we want to reach media, we have to have a news uh, that they can use and to get out. And that de depends, of course, on which kind of media it is. Uh, so it's a little bit different if it's a daily paper or if it's a special paper of some kind. We try to reach them all, but in different ways. So um, in the United Kingdom, what we've seen, unfortunately, is a, um, a reduction or a, a cutting back of the local newspapers. And to me, they were the best newspapers because they had all the really good stories that were really interesting for people and in detail as well. So what we've seen is them cut back um, and sometimes in the bigger national press, um, sometimes the emphasis shifts from the industrial story to a different angle. So I'd love to see more detailed stories of industrial um, things that are going on in workplaces and in communities in the national press. Um, and I think that would raise public consciousness as well. We certainly want publicity as a trade union on all of our campaigns. I mean, we certainly do do seek that. That's very, very helpful. And we find that some of these um, terrible companies that are exploiting our members, they do not like it when they get when that's exposed in the press. And sometimes that as well can be a huge lever to get them back around the table. Um, reaching an agreement with us that's better for our members and better for the services. So um, yeah, so I'd love to see more industrial stories and uh, more detail, um, you know, it, it, throughout the press, you know, in, in this country. And like I said, um, that's not happening as I would wish at the moment. But I'd love to. I'd love to see that. But I think one and I thank you for sharing this this very point um, on on the first point uh, raised by Yvonne. So definitely the polarization uh, and the fact that people live more and more in what we call like filter bubble of information is a big risk for our society. And actually in the reports that uh, Cassie mentioned at the beginning, 
beginning. So I, I worked with really amazing people to put to recommendation on what states and platforms should do to to fight disinformation. And really on the specific point you mentioned, having one of the recommendations that we put is, it's a little bit technical, but one idea would be to compel um, platforms to include in uh, the training of their algorithm a minimum percentage of re reliable information. So which means that in any algorithm, because everybody has its algorithm made for them, there would be a mandatory level of reliable information, let's say coming from uh, NHS, coming from uh, World Health Organization, and so on. So that's one of the 250 recommendations we put in, in our report on how to fight disinformation. But I think it, there's many avenues of how we could stop this this polarization of people living in in parallel worlds all next to each other and there's a technical solution that uh, uh, be compelled uh, to the platforms and i hope we're going we're going there on your point uh Hélène, definitely the local news are the ones who, who are missing here not have the magic wand to give money need to all the newspaper who were going to the city halls, who were checking on the expenses of local hospitals. But that's a huge lack of accountability for a lot of very powerful interests everywhere in the world. I mean, in the middle of the US, there's no, almost no newspapers covering um, uh, the, the, you know, the state's capitals and so on. It, it's, it's, it's a huge issue all over the world and nobody has figured out what would be the new business model for uh, reporting laws and that's uh, another big concern for our democracies um i believe that Leica is going to join us now and share some questions from people that have been watching like are you there yes yeah so we actually had quite a number of questions coming in for our different speakers and the first one is going back to uh, to Delphine a bit about uh, the story you shared about the plasma files. So the question is, uh, what was the response to your investigation from the US company Hemonetics that manufactured the plasma files? And you also mentioned that you were happy to say a bit more about the next steps of the investigation. So yeah, it would be also great if you could share a bit more on that. Thank you. So the answers, so we had many, found all media partners that exchange with Emonetics, where we sent uh, questions and they answered. Uh, so but the big picture was, we do nothing wrong, our machines are safe. It was a problem just happening in France and you take uh, email out of context. This give you the tone of the answer, but we were very happy. They were in, in details and to all the newspapers who we reach out to them. Uh, but of course, we, we shared their answers in the different uh, media articles. Um, but we put, uh, we, we have uh, raised uh, concerns about their versions. Um, it's, it's a, so a lot of things fronts are still ongoing. So Basically, we're still waiting to know what the French judicial system will there launch an investigation to see if the concerns of the um, donors in France uh, uh, are, are valid or not. We're still waiting to know what happened to the 300 uh, machines that were taken out of the market in France. Um, when the the articles were published, some Italian parliament members asked to launch some parliament uh, re inquiries. Uh, we are still looking at that, but of course, kind of COVID <laughs> slowed down everything. So we need to, to stay. Um, other uh, countries, parliament members express interest to, to look at this, especially in Germany and Netherlands. And we basically, when, when I say that, it's like we, we need to to keep asking questions to the national authorities, to not let COVID just put a, a hold on everything else. So I don't have precise answer, but it's an ongoing work to, to make sure it just doesn't 
been forgotten. Yeah, thank you very yeah, much for you sharing much. more information on that. Um, then there is a question specifically for Yvonne, or actually two questions that I hope you could answer both of them. Um, the first, of, uh, first is uh, how it has been for you to navigate the issues that you talked about alongside the Swedish COVID strategy uh, and any conversations you've had with your colleagues also around this. And then secondly, uh, how do you see the role of the healthcare unions in Sweden compared to uh, Helen's story about the UK? I'll start with the last question uh, because I, I realize we have a very different situation because when we have uh, our agreement with the SKR, the, the government, um, we are not allowed to go on strike. So we have a different situation. So we have to talk and, and negotiate without strikes. Uh, and that is a very different situation. Uh, and um, it's also a fact that uh, for we have very different organized unions. Uh, the nurses have their union, uh, the, the, <laughs> the others have theirs, uh, and we are uh, quite unique to have a trade union that is only for doctors, but at all levels. And that is um, kind of complicated too, to to represent both managers uh, and students at the same time. Uh, but we do manage in different ways. And sorry, I didn't uh, really get the first question. Uh, can you repeat um, that? Sure. Uh, the first question was kind of if you could say something about how it has been to navigate the issues you addressed during the specific COVID strategy of Sweden. Um, yes. And what your thoughts um, are on that? Uh, I'm the chair of our uh, local union and I'm not alone there. We have uh, many people that work really hard to, to get uh, strategies right. So we have two, uh, I don't know really the term in English, but safety officers in Swedish huvud, skyddsombud, that really have worked hard to, to get all the regulations uh, with PPE right, and we have had a lot of discussions with the, the leadership of the hospital and the county council on how um, how it should be. I, and um, uh, to get the information uh, to the colleagues, uh, it has been done a lot through different organisa organizations within the trade union, but not uh, the local part that I am part of. But we have also the, the interests, uh, we have uh, infectious disease uh, part and we have other parts that uh, collect and try to teach all the others through distance lectures. So we have uh, all learned a lot to continue with Teams meetings and uh, Zoom meetings to get new information. Was that uh, the thing you asked for? Uh, I think the person asking the question was also probably sp uh, referencing to the the Corona strategy of Sweden, so that there was a, quite a long period before the country went into lockdown. I mean, in other countries, maybe it was more strict. Yes, and, and um, we have our Folkhälsomyndighet that um, uh, work with this issue and uh, as I told uh, there are a lot of experts that are not uh, do not agree on uh, the conditions that are in Sweden uh, and it's all, always very easy to to look back in the mirror and tell how we should have done but I think the strategy have um, have had its flaws but uh, somehow we have managed to come through this far without a total lockdown, but partly lockdowns off and on. Um, I think the main issue right now is that um, the people in Sweden are very tired of uh, those lockdowns um, anyway, although we haven't had as hard ones at, as you have. Uh, and now they are gathering um, in too many gr gr uh, larger groups and uh, the new variants of the virus are spreading. And that is why we have the wave three. So 
we'll see what is happening the next few weeks. Uh, we have tried to, uh, our trade union has different levels uh, and I'm active on the local one. And then we have the, for the whole Sweden and they have uh, more discussions uh, on Sweden's strategy than I have. Yeah, thank you very much for your answers. Um, then we have also an audience question for Helen. Um, which advice would you give to your uh, ex-colleagues in the hospital to be able to denounce abuses safely? And what can they do to make their rights considered and respected? Well, my first key piece of advice is always to join a trade union and don't just treat a trade union like you're signing up for health insurance on your house, like it's there for just if you're in individual trouble at work. What you need to do is make sure you and all of your colleagues are in the union and that you're building solidarity together and that if there's any situation facing you, a health and safety issue, problems with um, patient, anything of this nature, you make sure you have a trade trade union meeting all of you to discuss it and decide how you're going to broach it with your employer and that way it's safe and you make sure you have the the region of the union full square behind you while you're doing that as well that's the safe way that's what I would advise and just st step up I, I'd say to people step up become a representative it's the best thing I ever did when I became a trade union representative yes it was scary yes there was a lot of things I didn't know but I learned as I went along and um, you will get supported if you've got a good region and a good officer and um, so I would say step up and become the rep because you look around you sometimes there's a, there's a problem on a ward or a hospital and um, everybody will know what the problem is but no one will want to do anything about it. That's the situation I found myself in. So I had to be the change. I had to step up and, and do that. Um, you know, it's, been, it's certainly been a very interesting journey for me but I certainly am very interested in, as a full-time organiser now to build um, collective action in the NHS. And don't get me wrong, it's not like the NHS, the strikes every day over here, or that there's fantastic levels of organization. There certainly is not. So I hope I haven't given a false impression about that. I'm just telling you about some of the stuff that I've tried to create based on my own experience and based what I can see the problem is. Because I know from my own experience as a health worker that um, if you look after yourself, patient care will flow so beautifully from that. And that's a key role that the unions can play Play. because we're in a situation in the UK, whether we like it or not, the NHS is being dismantled. It's been cut and it's been privatised. There's no getting away from that, unfortunately. I know it sounds really negative to say that, but the Conservative government in this country do not believe in the National Health Service. They want a privatised system. They want an insurance-based system, and there's no getting away from that. That's why it's so important, because we've got something that's so wonderful, and it's so important for us to like fight for it in this country and to do so with the patients, with the staff together, because the interests are completely aligned across both sides yeah maybe a bit of a follow-up question also dealing with the nhs uh, would you say that it was the pandemic that really opened people's eyes to this nhs issues around funding and privatization and could you also say if there's something that non-staff can do to support Absolutely. So I certainly think um, the views of the staff within the NHS have changed. Um, so I saw a lot of nurses, particularly um, before the pandemic, been willing to put up with a lot. Um, but they've changed that view. They've changed that view because the pandemic it's like a war situation for them. It's changed their understanding and their consciousness and they're coming into the trade union activity now and they're becoming more politicised because of the pandemic. Um, in terms of people outside the hospital, yes, absolutely, we want you. We want to engage with the social movements. There's so many springing up in the UK now because we've got rising unemployment, we've got um, cutbacks. Um, last year in the UK, there was a 95% increase in people claiming benefits because they've lost their jobs. So we're spiraling into a very difficult situation for people. So the social movements building up. And I would certainly like to see a, un a, un a uniting of the social movements with the trade unions. There's, there's much work to be done there. And absolutely, patients and the public must defend their hospitals because the healthcare, it's our social wages. So we get our wages from our work, but we also have our social wages, like our healthcare, education, etc. And we have to make sure we keep all of those, those things. Very, very important. Yeah, thank you very much for addressing that. And um, then there is a, a final question from the audience that also uh, 
for, for more of you, not specifically for one person, connecting also to the panel that we had yesterday, uh, uh, where we discussed the level of trust in authorities in different countries and how this could discourage reporting and whistleblowing. So could you say something about how is the level of trust in authorities in Sweden and the UK? And how does this affect the situation for whistleblowers? So I guess either Yvonne or Helen, since you're from the UK and Sweden, who wants to start? I would say that go, the Yvonne? trust is not enormous. Uh, uh, I can start. Uh, I would say that the trust is not uh, enormous. Uh, there are misbelief in uh, what is told from the government and from the different authorities. Um, I think the pandemic uh, in the beginning, it was better that, to have one government that uh, tells you what to do because we have to go in the same direction to, to be able to act uh, at, at all. But now when the, the, it's more stable, then people have different opinions on what to do the next step. And then it's obvious that there are misbeliefs in some ways and there are different uh, opinions on how to solve problems. Uh, and um, Helen described very well the, the, uh, the demounting of uh, NIHS. And uh, I can say that we are a little bit uh, down the road on the, in the same direction. I don't think everyone uh, sees it yet, uh, but uh, it is a prioritization of tillgänglighet. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it should be easy to get a doctor, but the quality is not as important for the government uh, and the reg regional government. So we are on the same road and we have to take actions on that. So, um, yes, in the United Kingdom, what we've seen the government do is funnel 37 billion pounds of money into private companies to produce PPE and for this test track and trace system for the coronavirus, which isn't working well. So a lot of people have seen that. So, yes, I think it's fair to say the trust in the government is going down because people cannot understand how 37 billion can be just given to the private sector to, to, to fail to deliver for us essentially when our health workers are being, you know, they've, been, they've ignored them in the last public sector pay announcements, so particularly amongst health workers, is increasing anger. And I think overall there's, there's a plummeting of trust. And we've seen it only last week with the policing of the UK. Um, so we've seen a terrible situation where the police were used heavy-handed tactics at a gathering. Um, and again, th there's been there's been much furor over that in this country. And um, yeah, I think it's fair to say that the government had a tiny little boost from the vaccination rollout, but I think overall the confidence in the system is starting to go down, down, down. And um, that's, yeah, that's a problem. And what we need is proper, I think we need, we, need, we need opposition because the danger is if you don't have effective opposition in this situation, you get the far right moving in, far right groups moving in, claiming that ground. So it could, be, could become even more dangerous and more unstable. So we need effective opposition to the government in this country. It's very, very important with, with uh, uh, describing an alternative to what's going on that's better for the people. I, if I may, can I just add a, a point? Because I think this question of distrust in authorities is key here and is really global. And actually, I see a link with a, a, a previous point we made about the disappearance of local news of um, and so on. And because I, I read a, a research that shows that actually the, the degree in distrust of authorities, I think is actually the highest in France among European countries, and I was really worried about that. But what was interesting is that actually it seems that m traditionally people used to trust more their local uh, authorities, their mayor, their local doctor, because they know these people. So, and you trust basically you will trust more what your family doctor tells you than what you see on TV from a doctor. You don't so that this kind of idea, but it's it's then relay linked to the fact that if we have a disappearance of um, local news and and so on, it's kind of uh, feed 
this global um, in authority. So that just reminds us the importance of the local news, the local authorities, and so on, in order to restore uh, trust um, everywhere. Uh, on so that was just a comment that I wanted to make because I, I really and I think it's a very concerning point this um, spreading distrust. Yeah, thank you very much for bringing that in and, and great you all contributed also to this this final question. I think we're kind of coming to the end of time now for this panel. So yeah, I would like to thank all of you so much for these great contributions and also thank you, Cassie, for the for the great moderation. It's been a, a great ending to this second day of the conference. So um, yeah, many thanks to all of you. And then um, I will say something about what's up for the rest of the conference. And uh, yeah, very happy to have had you with us today. Um, so tomorrow we have already the final day of our Behind the Mask conference, um, but I hope you will join us because there's actually a very amazing panel coming at the end. So tomorrow uh, at 11 Central European time until 1, we will have the panel on <laughs> Julian Assange, repression, isolation and lockdown with a great uh, uh, four speakers and also great moderator, uh, Sulet Dreyfus, Jennifer Robinson, Stefania Maurizzi, Felicity Ruby, and our moderator, Anna Myers. So we hope you will join us again for this final panel. And then also tomorrow in the afternoon, so from three o'clock Central European time, we have our online community workshop, Get Your Numbers Straight, Making Sense of Health Data, with one of our speakers today, uh, Serena Tinari. And she will teach us how you can develop a spider sense to spot red flags in public health communications and mainstream media reporting. And she will also give concrete examples out of the COVID-19 era and teach us how to uh, avoid common pitfalls. So we have just a final few spots left and you can sign up uh, via our website if you're interested in joining that. And also just to say at the end, if you're in Germany, uh, you can also still watch uh, the movie Coronation by Ai Weiwei that we had an interview about on Thursday. Uh, this film is freely screened online and you can still watch it until Sunday. But you just have to register on the website to get a ticket for that. So um, yeah, that's it for the final program. Then just, of course, uh, some final words to say a big thank you to the whole team of the Disruption Lab. So of course, to Tatiana Batsikeli for curating this conference, uh, to Elena Vajanovska and Nada Baker for doing the production, to Jonas Franke for making the beautiful design and also organizing all the slides behind the scenes, to Alana Travers, who's been handling our social media and also the chat, and to Claudia Trapp, who has been doing the press, and also Francesco Mancori, who has been taking care of the great light situation here, and Ranaf and Elisabeth of Boiling Head Media for taking care of the streaming. So many thanks to all of you and looking forward to see you back again tomorrow. <laughs>